the E-3A Ewan, an aircraft priceless in aerial conflict. The E-3A not only looks unique, but as a surveillance platform is very powerful. Mission crew re-identifying Alpha Golf 6742 hostile The AWACS is a flying radar site that sees the big picture for NATO. AWACS, NATO's eyes in the sky. Sky Sentry, next. aircraft patrols high over the Adriatic Sea. Its radar and other electronic sensors probe deep into Bosnia and other war-shattered nations formed with the breakup of Yugoslavia. It tracks every aircraft that takes to the sky. Aircraft Commander Major Dave Mulcair. I have control. I've been here for four years going and it will be five by the time I leave. And uh, in terms of the conflict, the nature of the conflict has changed a great deal in Bosnia, and uh, that has been a learning experience. NATO's AWACS, airborne warning and control aircraft, are the eyes of NATO commanders. They have guided bombing runs, helped enforce no-fly orders, controlled airlifts. Radar housed in their spinning rotodomes reaches hundreds of miles, and the AWACS can identify friend from foe. They are the nerve center of aerial warfare. In the windowless cabin of the aircraft, tactical director Joe McMillan commands 13 highly trained personnel. They play a key role in NATO's efforts to keep the lid on the Balkan tinderbox. TD pilot, we're max indicated airspeed. In the spring, we passed the 10,000 hour mark of, of missions down in Bosnia. Uh, and they've seen various things from the initial uh, watching what was going on, paying attention to when NATO went in and did some uh, bombing runs and, and that sort of thing, and then maybe paying a little bit more attention to what's going on down in Kosovo. For the most part, it's fairly routine, and then all of a sudden, something will happen where your adrenaline just gets pumping, and it's uh, you know five minutes of, of sheer excitement. from the monitor, we have possible threat 35085 miles southbound strength 2. If there's something out there that's uh, about 200 nautical miles away that we see and it's it's coming towards us and we can't identify it, I want to know about it. Flight deck from TD, we have potential threat 35080 uh, miles now. We're evaluating and we'll advise. And crew from the monitor, I'll show us that track. So I have the guys put a, send an arrow out and, and announce it that, that this is a potential threat. That gives me some time to uh, evaluate what's going on, where we're at, and what actions that we can take. That five or ten minutes of excitement, it, it all just comes together. In a conflict, no aircraft is more precious than an A-Wing. But it's unarmed, slower than modern fighters, and far less maneuverable. When a hostile aircraft appears on a course to intercept, it runs for safety and calls in help. PC from TD, I need you to evaluate that track. And TD PC, yes, I'm showing those aircraft to be in German. Ricky, uh, tornadoes. Mission crew re-identifying Alpha Golf 6742, hostile at this time. A yeah, cop section TD, if you can. Pilot TD, right now 34085. Pilot copies. Retrograde is a maneuver that is a, a last ditch effort to save the airplane. If the term retrograde is spoken, it's, um, it's because we're in great danger. The AWACS is a high value airborne asset, which means that if you're, if you're smart as the enemy, it's the first thing you want to get rid of. Unfortunately for the enemy, we can see them coming very early. 
Pilot from TD, TD push it up, uh, threat closing. Pilot copies. It's inside about 120 miles, and I haven't got a warm fuzzy that this guy is a, is a nice guy. I'm, I'm gonna move. Flight deck from TD. Retrograde left 170. Retrograding south 170. Crews of E3A AWACS do not carry parachutes. An array of antenna on the belly of the aircraft would pose a terrible danger to anyone trying to jump up. But there's little need. The AWAC controllers can direct fighters to the precise spot where they can shoot down threatening aircraft. And flight deck from the monitor. The F-16s are now our left eight o'clock. Five miles. Frequency right close seven through. Carlo Cerro on your radar identified to see to the area picture Clara. These guys have the capability of taking, you know, two two fighter jets, controlling him, giving him every direction in so that he is he rolls in behind the target and allowing that guy to visually identify that target. So the guy just has to look over and say, Yeah, that's a whatever type of airplane. If it comes to a crunch we can be down on the deck and uh, trying to outmaneuver our opponent. Uh, but with a large aircraft like this, it's going to be a difficult procedure. Let's face it, we're vulnerable, and our strength is our ability to see, and that's what we use. Clear right, Cole. Only an exercise, but the threat is real in the tent skies above Bosnia and Kosovo. AWACS in an area of conflict. Next. And TD pilot, turbine. Copy. Major Dave Balcair, one of the 120 Canadians assigned to NATO Air Base Geilenkirchen, Germany, near the Netherlands border. It's the largest permanent deployment of Canadians in the world. Multinational crews representing 13 NATO nations fly out of Geilenkirchen to maintain surveillance over the former Yugoslavia. It's an organization and a mission without precedence in the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. For veteran pilot Mulcair, Geilenkirchen offers a rare opportunity for operational flying. The airplane and the, and the role is different for me. I would say in a 20 one year military career, this would be the most operational flying I have ever done. Being over Bosnia with a multinational crew, it is real operational work and it is a real conflict. And that brings it home to an airman who is often removed from it. Another Canadian, Colonel Terry Chester, is not only CO of all Canadians posted to Gallenkirchen, but as commander of operations for the only fleet of aircraft ever to bear NATO markings. 0143 decimal four. Roger, take off announcement. And crew of passages from uh, the cockpit, we are clear for takeoff. Have a nice flight. The E3A AWACS is the only resource. It's actually owned by NATO. And NATO Air Base Gallenkirchen is the only NATO base in the world. Let me know when you call on station, okay? We'll go. We're first in and last out. When the fighters come in to take out the other enemy aircraft, it's the AWACS that directs them in, advises them that it's safe to go in, controls them into the fight, and when the fight's over, it controls the aircraft back to their home base. The AWACS obviously isn't right in the area. In fact, the AWACS is best if it's two to 300 miles removed from the area. That's where we get our best radar picture. Ground radar has line of sight limitations. AWACS can see farther and better. When they are electronically interfaced, very little escapes them. Tactical director Joe McMillan spent years in the radar bunkers of NORAD. North American Air Defense Command. Preparation for his role aboard the E-3A AWAC. The benefit of having an AWAC in addition to a ground site is the ground site will look out and up in the air, but because we're up in the air, we can look down and our detection looking down 
we can pick up the small things. We can pick up the ships on the, on the water. We can pick up uh, things that are slow moving like helicopters. And we can also eliminate a lot of the clutter that we would get from the ground because of the way the radar picks up things. Our principal job, obviously, is to downlink all of that intelligence down to the NATO commanders on the ground. At the same time, while we're doing that, we can control the fighters. And we can control the airspace above the battle area to make sure that the fight's going the way that the commander wishes it to go. NATO countries send the best of the best to serve with the AWAC force. They must overcome barriers of language, culture, and in some cases, strains and relations between their home countries. They work together in a very confined space. Colonel Chester says their professionalism is the key to the force's success. The crews literally check their flags at the door, and I have never uh, heard within the aircraft anybody ever refer to another individual's nationality. They are they're called by their crew positions. TD, display, clear switches. Mission crew, clear switches. Surveillance. Weapons. Whatever their home language, crew members must communicate in English and constantly guard against inaccurate terminology. We get on the jet, and uh, most of our primary language is something other than English. It means that we have to use standard terminology, we have to be careful of what we say, and we have to speak clearly to each other. East, 15 nautical mile radius. If things go wrong language-wise, they can really go wrong, and you have to be on your guard for that. We don't fly with um, set crews. We're relying on each other, maybe not even knowing each other. Penta 1-1, one, one, magic radio check. You may detect an accent when you hear stuff being spoken over the intercom. That's the only way you'll know that this guy uh, has is another nationality. It never enters into the fray. Traffic 14 miles. When things are quiet in Bosnia or Kosovo, AWAC patrols over the Adriatic settle into a routine but they never let down their gun. AWACs provide that giant eye in the sky that ground commanders have longed for since man first went to war. Next. From the beginning of flight, aircraft have been pressed into service to determine the intentions of opposing armies. The development of airborne radar was the answer to a soldier's prayer. The first purpose-built airborne early warning platform was uh, designed by the Americans in the 1950s, just as an extension of its uh, coast-based radars. They took a commercial airliner, the um, Super Constellation, and built a radar on top of it and called it the EC-121. The Super Connie, uh, EC-121, was used as a gap filler uh, for the radars. The U.S. military quickly realized the value of this platform and began to use it in other roles. For instance, the space program in the United States in the 50s uh, realized that they could use the, these radars to track ballistic missiles and splash points, etc. And interestingly, the AWACS is still used for that today. By the mid-60s, of course, the Cold War was beginning to uh, heat up, if I can use that term. And the Americans wanted to use this additional radar coverage to ensure the security of North America. So the EC-121 began to be integrated into the NORAD chain. To guard against an air attack on North America by Soviet nuclear bombers, chains of ground radar stations were built across Alaska and northern Canada. Those radar sites could not guard the ocean flanks, particularly the North Pacific, and they were vulnerable to low-flying aircraft. The Super Connies, with their bulky radomes, were brought into service to fill the gaps in radar coverage. American EC-21s flew patrols from Tinker Air Force Base in Oklahoma, from Alaska, and from U.S. bases in Japan.
With the war in Vietnam, the Super Connies, carrying advanced radar and communications, took control of the airborne. The Americans forward-based EC-121s to Southeast Asia, and there it was an integral part of their strike fleet. It uh, controlled over uh, 20,000 aircraft, flew over 50,000 hours, but more importantly, the EC-121 was integral in the rescue of over 80 downed airmen. What they would use is the, the radar to find out where this aircraft had gone down, and they would vector in the helicopters to pick up the downed airmen. Hold over. Hold over. Hold over. Survivors in the door. Survivors, finish secure. Let's get the hell out. Okay, talk to me. We're coming out. The value of airborne warning and control was proven in war, but the old Super Connies were on their last legs. It was time to start looking for a new radar platform to carry the ever more sophisticated electronic sensors and communications being developed. Only a jet would meet the specifications. Well, they, they went to again to a commercial airliner, a tried and proven airframe, this time the 707-320, and uh, built a great big radome and stuck it on top and designed integrated avionics to go within the airframe and called it the E-3, the E-3 Sentry. And the Americans built uh, over 30 of those, principally operating from Tinker Air Force Base with a 552nd wing there, up in Alaska, up in Elmendorf, and over in Japan. Operations of the E-3 sentries were veiled in secrecy. They took to the skies wherever U.S. aircraft and troops went into action, guiding fighter bombers, warning aircraft and ground troops of attacking enemy aircraft. In Europe, NATO's commanders quickly saw a need for their own AWAC force. In the 1970s, the major NATO commanders realized that they too had gaps in their radar coverage. We were interested at that time in, obviously, the threat being the Russian threat. Um, and one of the, the Russian war tactics is the old German Blitzkrieg, where they would throw everything forward all at once. Their fighter bombers would come in, strike attack aircraft, followed by the ground forces. Well, the major NATO commanders realized that the ground-based radar coverage was not sufficient to give them the warning they needed. So they looked at, the, obviously, the E-3A sentry, as a, a, a gap filler. In the late 70s, the nations of the NATO alliance agreed to purchase 18 E-3As at a cost of $1 billion. It cost another billion to establish a ground support facility and to purchase ancillary equipment. They are based here at Geilenkirchen, and uh, we forward base them in Trapani, Italy, in Acteon, Greece, in Konya, Turkey, and in Orland in Norway. The value of NATO's AWACS did not end with the Cold War. They are superb platforms for aerial surveillance. We could put our radar station up in the air and just watch what's going on, even if there was no conflict going on, just monitoring traffic. And, and as you know, the AWACS is also capable of monitoring electronic systems. It can mo monitor other people's radars and ground transmissions. It can do all that as well as its radar. So we're, if you will, a big intelligence gatherer. AWACS were flown in whenever there was a rise in tension anywhere in the world, keeping a watch. Their creed, first in, last out. In the Gulf War, the AWACS reverted to their role of controlling the air battle. Day and night, they circled at altitude, orchestrating the most complex air war ever fought. Colonel Chuck Winstead, Tinker Air Force Base, home of U.S. AWACS. Always on these aircraft, the missions were about were 16 hours. That was our plan, sorties. Across the front, we had uh, numerous C3s who had divided up their task in their areas of responsibility to provide the best possible coverage to each of our strike forces. At the same time, then we would integrate these pictures that we had and send them back to the Joint Forces Commander sitting miles away. And he could assess then which assets had to be tasked for the next day's missions. 
Without having been there, it's hard to imagine the density of aircraft traffic in one small area at one short compressed period of time. But it's been described as watching O'Hare Airport in the middle of uh, the busiest day of the year uh, with the air traffic associated. Imagine having that and not knowing who the good guys are and who the bad guys are. The sky sentries guided 20,000 aircraft to tankers. They directed 28 of the 31 air kills of Iraqi aircraft. During Desert Storm, we controlled over 31,000 strike missions. And during that time, with the E-3's God's eye view of the battlefield, we were able to determine if any of those strikers were in harm's way from an air-to-air -air threat. During that entire conflict, not one U.S. fighter was lost due to enemy air-to-air -air fires. The AWAC is a marvel of the electronic age. Next. From the exterior, an AWAC aircraft is unassuming. An airliner without passenger windows, distinguished only by its turning rotodome. It carries its secrets within where specialists spy on the enemy and control the fight of attacking aircraft. NATO's fleet uses one of the most reliable airframes ever built, the 1970s designed Boeing 707, an aircraft popular with commercial airlines all over the world. Its passenger compartment is filled with consoles and crew. The E3A as we fly it has a gross takeoff weight, a max gross takeoff weight of 325,000 pounds and a wingspan of 146 and a length which is pretty much the same around 145 feet. The standard crew is 17 on board, a flight deck of four and a mission crew of 13. The engine is a Pratt & Whitney TF-33. Uh, it's 21,000 pounds of thrust rated. Uh, that varies from 21,000 down to about 19,000 depending on the temperature. Uh, one of the characteristics of this engine uh, being on the military aircraft is that it doesn't have thrust reverse. It's very rare for an aircraft this large with four engines not to have thrust reverse. Without the thrust reverse, uh, our landing performance is a little bit less optimum. We rely entirely on the brakes to stop the aircraft. The very first piece of equipment we come to when we uh, walk from the forward to the back of the airplane is the weather radar housed right here. And right below that is a chin dome. This was added recently. It's the electronic support measures or part of the electronic support measures. There's more ESM as we walk around the airplane. You can see the, uh, the canoe here. There's one of these on each side. ESM sensors mounted at four places on the aircraft allow the AWAC to spot radar emitters on the ground or in the air. It's the most highly classified equipment on board, the most recent upgrade to its array of sensors and monitors. The rotodome is what distinguishes an AWAC from all other aircraft. It stands 11 meters from the ground, is nine meters in diameter. It's big enough that technicians can stand up inside of it to make repairs. A sensitive Westinghouse radar scanner occupies half of the rotor dome. An IFF sensor, identification, friend or foe, the other half. The cockpit of the E3A is a tight fit for a four to five person flight crew. Two pilots, flight engineer, navigator, and a visual observer when the aircraft embarks on low-level flight. Cruise to code, clear for takeoff. Before takeoff checklist completed. Roger. One of the aspects of the rotor dome that really affects the performance uh, are the struts. As you notice, there's two struts supporting the rotor dome turntable. What that does to us is uh, it blanks out some of the rudder effectiveness on takeoff. So what they have done for this airplane is uh, increase the rudder deflection uh, to 23 degrees for the actual rudder surface, but they have also changed the per takeoff performance data. Other than that, the rotor dome really is a, uh, a hindrance in, in the high-speed envelope of the airplane. It, it uh, max Mach is decimal 7.8.
It's common for a 70, 707 to have a max Mach of about 84. Before joining NATO's AWAC force, Joe McMillan worked at a ground radar site. With his ground experience, McMillan, who commands the mission crew, knows how vital it is to provide a constant flow of AWAC radar data to ground stations. Working in concert, they provide a complete picture of air movement. Uh, so the composite radar picture is sent to KAOC, NATO's Combined Air Operations Center. The range of the AWACS radar is classified, but controllers concede it has a reach of hundreds of miles, enabling the aircraft to stand far off from an area of conflict. Depending on weather phenomenon and, and how the radar is actually working that day, um, sometimes we can see in excess of, of uh, 300 miles. Directly below us is, is a vulnerable area as well. We call it the cone of silence. We can't see what's down below us. Our aircraft is actually blocking the, the radar beam from going below. So normally we will select an orbit that's close enough to a, a ground radar that they can provide any sort of threat warning for aircraft that are flying in our cone of silence. There's a very large weight range that it flies in, and it's, a, it's really a different airplane heavyweight than it is lightweight. From a pilot's perspective, there's a lot to do. It's a very manual aircraft. You could probably see from the instruments that, uh, compared to a modern airliner, this is fairly antiquated equipment. And that means that uh, it's old pilot uh, watch map ground or aviate navigate communicate type of airplane, which makes it a lot of fun. Most of the Canadian pilots, myself included, come from smaller, smaller aircraft, uh, with the exception of our 707 or Airbus. And uh, I think most of us find that this aircraft is uh, a little more of a handful than we're used to. It's not very nimble or very agile. And that just means that you have to do a little bit more uh, manhandling or uh, arm handling of the, uh, the yoke to get the aircraft to go where you want it to go. The, uh, the things that, that are, uh, if you will, risky for this aircraft is because of its, uh, its size and the fragility of the equipment on board is the weather. Uh, we, we do not tolerate turbulence very well. We have 17 people on board that are performing 11 different jobs. Many of the people that uh, arrive and, and do the job of the mission crew are flying for the first time. It's their first tour as an as air crew. Okay. So turbulence uh, makes our job a lot more difficult. Joe McMillan oversees the work of the mission crew. All the displays that we have, display tech, DT, he's responsible for all the, the, the computers, the consoles and everything else, powering up the computer that takes the radar from the, the, from the radar tech and everything else and displays it out on our screen for us. He has the capability of bringing up all the information, but we have to go through him. Magic 768026. Up in the front of the aircraft, we have a comm section. There's a comm operator and a comm technician. They maintain and operate the 20 sets of radios that we have, as well as the intercoms on the uh, on the aircraft itself, dialing up frequencies and that sort of thing to help us out. Display RT on maintenance. Let me know when you're ready. In the back of the airplane is a radar technician. When we get airborne, he fires up the radar, gets it going, transfers it through the display control, the computer, so that we can use it. We can see it on the radar screens. And he also maintains the equipment that's down in the lower part of the aircraft. And from time to time, he has to go down there to do some in-flight maintenance on the radar. We normally have three weapons controllers on board. They're, they're a team, a weapons team. And you normally have an FA, which is the fighter allocator. He's like the supervisor of the weapons section. The AWAC carries a bank of surveillance operators called SOs. They scan the radar monitors and operate the IFF, identification, friend or foe. One of the SOs is responsible for the links, the digital readout sent to NATO ground stations, the command center, or when required to NATO assigned warships. The person that sits next to the uh, surveillance controller is called the PC. PC is a passive detection controller. 
and that's the electronic support measures equipment that was added to the NATO E3s within the last couple of years. And what these sensors do is they listen. They like to listen out, and what they listen for is other signals that come from other airplanes, for example, or from other ground sites. So whether they be radar sites uh, or uh, surface-to-air missile sites, that sort of thing. The PC sensors are brought into play on a short mission to monitor a Russian military exercise off the coast of Sweden. Every radar emits a different signal. Those of the Russian aircraft are entered into NATO data banks, so the aircraft types can be identified in a future encounter. Of the 13 nations crewing NATO's AWACS, only those from the United States have had previous experience on the E-3. That experience is valuable in the training of NATO pilots. The Americans, uh, that is the U.S. air crew, um, do bring a lot of experience to the component. And that's, that's not only because they've flown the E-3 before, but they have also flown on large airplanes, the B-52, uh, the KC-135, uh, our model, which is what we refuel behind, that's a tanker, the, um, the KC-10s, all kinds of Boeing 707 variants. So they have a lot of large aircraft experience, and that makes all the difference. Thank you, both. That's good, George. American operators also bring valuable experience to the NATO force. All other nations, Canadians, Belgians, Turks, and all the rest, have experience only with ground-based radar. In the U.S., it's an airborne classification. Upgraded avionics and an even higher level of technology have been loaded into Boeing's next generation AWAC, the 767. Its wide body configuration provides 50% more floor space and nearly twice the internal volume of the 707. It has greater range, 10,300 kilometers without refueling and a higher service ceiling, more than 40,000 feet. No AWAC aircraft has ever been shot down. Highly trained crews and their ability to detect enemy aircraft and call in fighters for protection ensure their safety. It's a combination NATO relies upon in the skies over Bosnia. Next. Dawn breaks over NATO Air Base Geilenkirchen. Briefings for the crew assigned to today's mission over former Yugoslavia. They're told of threats in the operational area. The uh, mission that we're going to do today is uh, Hotel 1 Mike 116, call sign NATO 26 Magic 76. The objectives for today provide the recognized air picture for the, uh, for the KOC, airborne threat warning. The orbit we're going to be using, we're going to be coming down from Guyland Kirk and through, down through the Adriatic. We'll go directly to India 5 Echo Echo down in the southern Adriatic so we can keep an eye on things in here, including the, the Kosovo area and up in, uh, up in Bosnia. RMI check. Well, no, that's right. Okay, crew, call sign is NATO 26. The emergency is prior to be one if the pilot, co-pilot, or flight engineer notice a rudder boost, any fire, or an engine malfunction which makes the aircraft unsafe for flight. Call reject. I'll perform the bold face. Back me up on the spoilers. Car NATO 26, ready to start. Ground pilot. Go ahead. We've been cleared. Engine start. Copy. Okay, you got a fireball. Engine number one is good to stop. Clear for now. Stop engine number one. No. Go ahead. Gear up, gear up. Today we are doing a, uh, a deliberate forge sortie. What we are doing is orbiting in a location uh, known as India 5 Echo Echo, which is about uh, at its closest point, 22 miles from the coast of uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina, and at its farthest point, about uh, 45 or 47 miles away. 
To reach the Adriatic, the AWAC flies high over the Alps. It takes an hour and a half to reach its orbit area. Pilot Dave Mulcair's flight plan calls for the aircraft to remain on station for six hours. Our job is to keep the uh, aircraft in a stable platform for the radar to be able to do its job. And that's what we're out here doing today. You can see uh, we're very close to the coastline of BH. And uh, that's not normal for an E3A employment. We're usually much farther away in uh, the tactical doctrine. The significance of this mission to us, interestingly, is that this is serious business. Um, Canadians have been flying in E3A AWACS aircraft over Bosnia longer than World War II lasted. I could guarantee you that in 99% of the missions that have flown over Bosnia and over the former Yugoslavia area, there's been a Canadian on board. When the conflict in Bosnia started, I myself did, did not know much about what was going on there, who was there. As it's unfolded over the years, uh, it's become obvious to me personally that it is, it's a modern tragedy uh, in, the, in the worst sense of the word. Being here as an Air Force officer and flying this airplane has been an opportunity to, to be part of something, some action, that uh, hopefully has been for the good. Knowing that Canadians, for instance, are on the ground there makes a difference to us. Knowing that we have Canadian F-18s uh, that are patrolling over that area makes a difference to us. Uh, we recognize that we are part of the bigger picture, but this is very serious business. Very serious business indeed. When four Serb fighters violated a no-fly zone, ignoring repeated radio warnings, NATO commanders gave the order to take them out. All four were shot down by fighters guided by AWACS. It was the first exercise of deadly force in NATO history. Although things have settled down a little, uh, clearly we're not at the point of incipient war all the time. Uh, the recent problems in Kosovo, for instance, alert us that things are not well, and we don't anticipate things getting better in the FYA for some time. So the crews were always aware that they're only a heartbeat away, only a day away from uh, the situation getting out of control again, and that the one aircraft that they miss on their scope, the one aircraft they fail to control properly, uh, may be the one that causes a conflict to boil over again. Pan uh, Magic, after gate two, descent on six. Code Magic is call sign for AWAC weapons controllers, directing fighters into patrol areas and steering them to a refueling area known as Sunny. The skies over Bosnia are filled with fighter bombers and transports on NATO missions, patrols, and exercises. My responsibility is uh, to be the controlling agency for the Adriatic Sea. All aircraft coming from land-based air bases flying uh, to Bosnia to complete a mission. We have the town of Sarajevo here. We have Bandia Luka in this area. Tuzla is a civil airfield, and for these uh, airfields we have to deconflict our military jets with civil airliners. We have a uh, French operating and supporting, we have Norwegian aircraft supporting the airlift, we have a uh, German recce uh, tornadoes flying, we have a uh, Belgian, we have the uh, Netherlands, Canadian, Italians, British Jaguars uh, supporting the mission. To, Joe uh, McMillan calls for alterations in the AWACS orbit to and to adjusts the radar, down. trying to overcome geographical barriers that can hide aircraft from the AWACS prying scanners. The, the cat and mouse kind of things that can happen from time to time is there's a, there's a mountain chain that runs sort of uh, north, northwest, southeast over Croatia and Bosnia, but the mountains can get in the way and you, you have a little bit of refraction that you can bend over the mountains but not a whole lot so what we find is that a lot of traffic can go in the other side of the mountain that we just we just don't have the capability to see so we also have other orbits we have an orbit up in the uh, north north over Croatia right now that's a much better orbit because our radar has the ability to look down in the valleys for AWAC pilots like Dave Mulcair long hours in orbit often mean a battle against boredom 
Now, our mission as pilots is to get the platform up to where the mission crew can do their work. And for us, uh, that can mean sitting on autopilot for upwards of six hours. Uh, we get around that by uh, spending some of that time getting to know what they're doing in the back and listening to what they are actually doing. That keeps us sharp and it keeps us in the mission. NGTD, the radar is transferred. We're uh, powering it down. We're waiting for the IFF until we hear tally. Okay. Dave Mulcair has been ordered to extend the mission. He's been on station now for eight hours, and the E-3A is running short of fuel. He pulls out of orbit and sets a course to rendezvous with the KC-135 tanker. Air-to-air -air refueling sets the adrenaline pumping. Under the best of conditions, it's a dangerous business. Air-to-air -air refueling is something few Canadians do before they get here. Our Canadian fighter pilots will have done it, but as a transport uh, driver, I have never air refueled before coming here. It's a matter of getting to a position about three miles behind the tanker, a thousand feet below the tanker, uh, and closing in from that position to a position 50 feet behind the tanker and stabilizing in that position. We call that pre-contact. 2-6 stable, pre-contact ready. The E-3A closes the tanker at an overtaking speed of less than five miles an hour. Pilots must fly straight at the tanker's center line, approaching from below, gauging distance from marks on the tanker's belt. A rush of air indicates the probe is riding above the cockpit, breaking the airflow. It's a heart-stopping sound. The two giant aircraft only meters apart. A boom operator aboard the tanker flies the probe into place. Three sevens contact. Two six contact. Both aircraft are doing 275 indicated, and I think the true airspeed or ground speed is around the uh, 360 mark. It's exciting. It's what pilots really like to do because it's hands-on and there's an element of risk involved. Um, after a while, it's easy, but it's not easy to learn. And uh, the other challenge is we do it at night, which uh, is a real thrill for us. The pilot must hold the AWACS steady in this precarious place for 20 minutes, making constant adjustments in trim as 50,000 pounds of jet fuel flood into the E-3A's tanks. The weight of our airplane and the center of gravity will change a great deal with that 50,000 pounds. We'll put that in the front of our airplane, and the front of our airplane will get heavier. It'll mean large power changes over time, uh, over the time we're refueling, and it'll mean a fairly large trim change as well, which if you don't do, you're just simply gonna fall off the boom. You can't hold it with your arm. Being here has matured me as a pilot, uh, certainly, because the E-3 is such a large aircraft and a different from all the other airplanes I've flown. And in that sense, uh, it's really rounded out my flying career. We say that flying this aircraft is hours and hours of pure boredom interspersed by moments of pure terror. I still enjoy the aviation. I still enjoy uh, getting up at 5 o'clock in the morning, believe it or not, and going off a briefing. And, and the rush that you get at the end of the runway, there's no feeling like it. Uh, still, after all the hours that I've flown, I do this for nothing. Is it something to be proud of? Yes, it is definitely something to be proud of. We know that we've made, over the years, uh, a difference of some sort. 
and um, we're proud of each other, the, the people who wear this uniform uh, of all the nations and the Canadians as well. NATO's sky sentries, keeping the vigil, scanning the skies. 260 sentry, 5 Mission successful. 